Why are you paranoid? Because I, I'm just going to fess up when I do my Instagram videos. I run it uh -huh. through that filter and I'm like, yeah, my skin is too red and I pull the saturation back a little bit. You didn't even notice, did you? <clears throat> well, I, I just figured you had brighter lighting. No, it's the same lighting. I just, I don't know how to set this lighting up in here to be right. Hey, watch that. Look at that. I've already fixed. I, I'm still red, but now I don't have that glare. Which way looks better? Okay, this welcome. way. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> wait a minute. We're doing a podcast. Yes. Okay. Welcome to the Always Right Podcast, where sometimes we just get a little off topic and we talk about things that have nothing to do with writing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm excited about the topic for today. I got to give props out to Carissa because, <laughs> um, man, she carries a lot of weight. Uh, all of you who are watching this podcast, you need to reach out and thank her because she literally schedules, researches, comes up with the ideas for all these podcasts. And I'm over here like a squirrel running back and forth. St started feeling guilty. So I said, what, about five weeks ago, I'll go back to episode one and make a video every week. <clears throat> and I'm, dang it, I'm sticking to it so I don't get in trouble. And I'm proud of you. I'm very <clears throat> proud of you. Yes. And I like, uh, I don't know, because I, I was talking to Jeff Rivera this morning. Cause I don't know if you read, he wrote, he watched the latest video on writing. Uh, you need to go back and watch all these podcasts if you're listening today, by the way. So we're talking about writing, self-editing, hiring an editor in episode five. And he's like, wow, that was wonderful. Did you read the wording? He said, yeah, I did. I'm like, yep. AI. AI. <laughs> so I'm going to be fast. I love AI now. I write it out. I'm like, let me spruce this up a little bit and see what sounds like me. Then I'll do a run through, scrub it, and then I'll re-edit it. And that's what I put out. All right. We should have done this episode on revisiting AI. We should have because uh, I, good thing I had taken caffeine this morning. <clears throat> so you really have your hands full. So let's get started on the art of writing short stories. Yes, that is our topic for today. The art of writing short stories. And the reason I picked this topic is because sometimes people think, oh, you know, it, it's just a short story. But short stories have kind of made literature a foundation with a lot of like the Hemingways and the... Uh, some of the Hawthorne like stuff that they would do back then, they, they were very short stories because they were cheaper to print. You had to get your words across. Short stories kind of laid that foundation. Not to mention oral translations that have been done over time um, were written down, but they were short versions. Anything that you're reading in your a lot of your religious texts, sometimes those are combined. So I wanted to talk, tackle, tackle a topic that kind of gets overlooked in that short stories. Yeah, and you know what's brilliant about this is there are a lot of you listening to this podcast. You're like, oh, I really want to start writing. I don't know where to start and this and that. <laughs> what if this is the one to, to inspire you to write just a short story? Just start, start writing. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, that'll you get you hooked. That, never know where that's going to take you. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you remember any of the short stories from your your childhood that you liked? That that I, oh, okay, I thought you meant uh, that I liked, that I read. Oh, I yeah. can only remember like Dr. Zeus and stuff like that, but that was like third grade. You know what? Yeah, I, I mean, those are short stories because they're ch children's books based I mean, on that. I kind of got in. I know we'll talk about like novellas yeah. here in a little bit, so it's a little longer than a short story. Yes, but, short but, stories. That, yeah, that's the thing. Short stories. I mean, just because the word count is short doesn't make it an actual short story. Yeah, there correct. Has to be kind of a development. I feel like <laughs> um, with um, Doctor Seuss, when you're talking about that. There's not that's a real picture there. writing. Yeah, that's like 50 words. That's rhyming. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah. No, I honestly don't. I remember reading some almost like James Bond Jr. books that were like 15,000 words. So that really doesn't count as a short story, uh, more of as a mm -hmm. novella. But that's, that's – and I can remember writing short some stories. Some of the novellas – yeah, some of the novellas I think fall into the category because they're borderline. Um, so that is kind of one of those things that's kind of grandfather. It's in that middle middle range. Of, what, I mean, what is the word count? What do, would you consider a short story? So, I mean, traditional word count is between 1,000 to 7,500 words for a yep. traditional. But what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go over some of them that I didn't even know existed and break down the different uh, short story subcategories, uh, which I found kind of cool. Cool. So, so we're going to start with subcategories. Yes. <clears throat> so, flash fiction and i was like ooh, flash. flash fiction this is so these are extremely short these are under a thousand words these are ones that you really have to make a significant impact when you're writing in that short amount of time so, um i'm trying to think i'm kind of wondering if like reader's digest had a lot of that 
Oh, you know, that's a great example. Something that, uh, that was like a installment in there, like a small story that would, that's probably, you know what? You're probably right. That would be a great example. There was another, I can't remember the name. It was, is about the size of a reader's digest book and it was for science fiction. And that mm-hmm. was popular like 60s, 70s, 80s. I cannot remember the name of it, but I do remember getting some of those magazines and they were super quick read. And I guarantee mm-hmm. you they were that short, you know, eight and 900 yeah. words. Yeah. No, and there's <clears throat> also something even shorter than that, which I'm, you know, so, and I went and kind of researched like the, the, the shortest microfiction. So microfiction <laughs> is like typically under 300 <clears throat> words. So I'm like, okay, what's a well-known. Oh, um, yeah, I know. Microfiction. <laughs> What is not, it? Not just because I can read it here, but I was like, oh my gosh, I remember this. Uh, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Six mm-hmm. word story. It's attributed to Ernest Hemingway. And it's, uh, I don't even want to read your writing. It's just you, because you, you do it so eloquently. And I'll be like, eloquently, I can't even pronounce. It's yeah. a prime example of extreme brevity in storytelling. Yes, I feel smart yeah. now. And Despite, it is, well, yeah, because it, it is very powerful because it's for sale. It was Baby so shoes. emotional. Never worn because you're like, oh, someone has lost a child. Absolutely, that's yes. what. I, yes, it's like, oh my gosh, and then your your mind starts wondering, like, what happened? Was it in childbirth? Were they, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a year old? What, yes. what happened to this child? Yeah. You know, yeah. So your 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 reader has six words, but they've already got this whole like, I need to know what happened. Like they're already, it is, yeah, yeah. Okay, so from that, go on to the next one while I'm scrolling here, vignettes. Uh, vignettes, they're short, descriptive literary sketches that focus on moments, characters, or settings rather than a complete narrative arc. So, I mean, it's a quick way to get into just a tiny little story with not a lot of backstory. It could be, mm-hmm. you know, uh, if it's a little horror a story, it could be, something like hey mommy there's a monster under my bed and, and mm-hmm. no you know there's and go to sleep and back and forth and back and forth and she looks and then the mom's pulled underneath but she really don't know where did the monster come from what happened to the mother did the child survive so it don't give mm-hmm. you anything I, I love those type of stories because it's great for your imagination you're one mm-hmm. you're wondering and i know there have been I can't even think of an example. I want to say Stephen King, but I know that's not true. Uh, I know he's written shorter stories that's turned into movies yeah. and bigger books. But, um, you know, I can't think of like a vignette right off the point. Maybe Warrior would be a good one by Terry Brooks. Uh, and that's about a, a little character, uh, a little Sylvan. And, uh, well, there's a couple that he's done that ties into a bigger story arc that he's, uh, that he's released called The Word in the Void. But on mm-hmm. itself, standing alone... It don't give you a ton of backstory, and it don't need to. Your imagination's mm-hmm. running wild, but then when you see that it's part of a bigger story arc uh, of some full-length novels, uh, then it makes more sense. But that's okay. Uh, he lets yeah. the reader just kind of use their imagination and let it run wild to where it needs to go. Yeah, and I think it's not necessarily – like even like small graphic novels, like, or not novels, uh, comic strips in a sense. Yep. Kind of fall into this because it's a small – um, it's a very small, uh, focus on the moment that's happening. So you can kind of like sort of put that in there because so vignette could also fall into some of the serialized stuff that we'll talk about here in a second. But yeah, there, that one's kind of like a very vague open, you're creating a, a visual sketch of what's happening, but it's not very long. I was hoping you would catch when I said big net. I was trying to make up a new word for the board. But yeah, yeah. Like, I wasn't even I wasn't even gonna call you out. I was gonna be like, you know what? <laughs> no. I, was like, your tongue, go I, for it. I was thinking of my film guy. We were eating one day and he's like, I think I want to get in a mellet. I'm like, What? Oh well, yeah, the omelet? omelet? Yes, the omelet. <laughs> so I'm always screwing up words on purpose. You didn't even yeah. bat an eye. <laughs> no, I did I heard it, but I was like, I'm not even gonna call him out. I'm not gonna do it. Because I feel like sometimes when I do that, I'm like mean and I'm like, mm, I shouldn't do that. No, but that, that's the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So traditional short stories, like we said, yep. generally range from 1,000 to 7,500 words. And you're following a typical structure, which we'll get into uh, more, that has the beginning, the middle. You have that, um, that plot uh, development. And then you have the end, of course. And, but you, you have that central conflict still, like a regular story would, but just shorter. Yeah, to me, because I'm always thinking visually, it's almost like watching a television show like a, mm-hmm. an episode, you know, so if you would actually print out the words the characters were saying, it would fall into that which, and there's a short story. But of course that would probably lead to like right. serialized fiction. Yeah. I feel like that, even though like when you put out 
a book, their like episode, whatever. That's you not. Have, like, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, you kind of have that traditional style starting with it, <laughs> and then you kind of just make it more sometimes serialized. But there's a whole, like, there's a whole thing where you have sometimes cross platforms where it's like you have the short story here within your book that translates to another book. You kind of have that going on with all the stuff that you write as well. Yep. I yeah. do. Th that's like all the fiction. If you really look closely and I need to plot this out, they are all in the same world and connected on a timeline. <clears throat> they all have influenced each other. Which is where this next one comes in. This is what I was talking about. This sudden fiction. The sudden fiction is, it's like a brief storytelling. And it's a little longer than micro fiction. Um, but it kind of focuses on the moment in a series of connected events. You have a series of connected events that in a timeline, a lot of your books all come together, but they're not necessarily in that book series. But if you could literally yep. create this connection here to this. Yeah. Cool. I put a couple here. Yeah. That... I was going to say, cause you had a couple, like the story of an hour, like, and I've never heard of this book. So this is a classic story follows Louise Mallard, a woman who experiences a complex range of emotions upon hearing uh, of her husband's death. Initially, man, I can, I'm not saying I can relate to this, but I could see this happening to somebody. Initially overwhelmed with grief, she soon feels a sense of unexpected liberation, imagining the possibilities of her newfound independence. However, the story takes a dramatic turn with an unexpected ending. Now I want to read this. Right. <laughs> and I will, so we can kind of talk about it in the future. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so this sticks by George uh, Sanders, Sounders, Sander, Sanders, Sanders, Saunders. I don't know. Does. Well, that's probably sounds a little more elegant. Yeah. This is just a brief description of a father who starts tradition of decorating metal pole in front of his yard for every holiday. Each decoration uh, revealing something about his emotional state and uh, his relationship with his family. And over time, these decorations become a symbol of his attempts to communicate and connect with his children. I think of something we, we kind of do that a lot, I think, with just anything. We put out these acts of love because of what we may not have had in our past. So that would be kind of interesting. I like this. The next one. Yes. Serialized short stories. This is what you do, darling. This yeah. Is your didn't even story. put it into that. I didn't even think about it. But really going back to 2008, when we started things like Age of the Sigil and uh, Order of Five, really, is where we started before Sigil. That was kind of Daniel's plan. He's like, we need to have like the cliffhangers. They used to have these old television shows in the 40s and 50s, 30 minute. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you left on a cliffhanger. So there's a story within a whole big world. And every chapter in a book that I've written, like Order of Five or Age of the Sigil, is actually serialized short stories. So we have like mm -hmm. 13 short stories that take you on a different adventure but still there's connecting elements between that. So yeah. uh, in, in the beginning we did, like it says here, they're released in sequential segments, each serving as a standalone piece while contributing to a larger narrative. That's mm -hmm. what we did because um, Kindle started in 2007 and like beginning of 2008, middle of 2008 is when we started on Kindle and we were doing it before anybody. They didn't have Kindle shorts or anything. Uh, I looked everywhere and I'm not, I'm being humble when I say this. I don't think anybody but Daniel and I were doing that. Boom, 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 an episode. And we were doing it per week. Uh, we already mm -hmm. had the books written. And then we was like, eh, you know, it's, it didn't take off like we thought mm -hmm. it would. So we just like, eh, we'll just put it ahead in Ahead of your book. time. Yeah, well, ahead of our time. So we put it in a big book and I'll be gosh, like six, seven years later, boom, Kindle mm -hmm. Shorts, you know, and everyone's doing it, releasing a chapter a week or something. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Which is kind of like fan fiction yeah. falls in here because people release like new, once a series is done, they release additional chapters or small short stories and backstories about characters that may have not been told. So that's kind of where fan fiction would fall in. Um, the Martian, do you remember? I don't know if you were. I didn't know it was like this. That's cool. And now nowadays everyone's doing fan fiction or even bigger authors. They do this. They release a chapter per week, and they they have conversations on a Facebook group or something. They kind of let input from the fans, like, "Oh, I wish it would go in this direction." Mm -hmm. I don't know if Ware uh, Andy Ware did that with this, but well, he you originally know, published it in installments. So he had it done. He wasn't you. I mean, I don't know if he was using people to influence his writing. I see that nowadays too. Like, oh, yeah. you know, I haven't written the next uh, chapter. What do you think I should write about? Okay, I like that idea. I'll use yeah. you as my muse <laughs> well even even though this isn't technically 
um, I mean, it was on the radio, but if you think about back in the day, whenever War, War, War of the Worlds War, yeah, was done, people thought it was kind of like this, sh- people were like, oh my gosh, not realizing it's a story. Yep. Or even like Little Orphan Annie, things that they would put out, like what's happening this week? You know, it, before they had major TVs in every home, they would put out stories over the radio that kids would listen to being read. Those are kind of like the short stories. And then over time, they would just put them in a large book. But essentially, each chapter was its own standalone, in a yep. sense. Which, I didn't put this on here, but technically, Hunger Games uh, by Susan Collins, that one falls under serialized short stories because each chapter is talking about the districts. It has its own. Each chapter can kind of stand alone, and then it's a compilation of all of them together. They could be... Yeah, so she's moving from different scene to different scene per chapter. Well, I don't remember um, exactly how that was done, but I think because of the way it was written, each chapter could be its own installment of what's happening at that, like at that moment, and you could it gives you its own cliffhanger. No, that's cool. If that makes sense. So, not if you're writing a novel, not every chapter has a cliffhanger. You know what I mean? So it's where it has each chapter has a cliffhanger. It makes it serialized because it's like each one is making the reader um, feel like it could stand as like, what's happening next? What's happening next? So there's that some of the novels even can fall into the serialized uh, short stories as their chapters can be standalone. Um, Man, you just took the steam out of my sails too for this next one because I now realize I've never written a novel. Mm -hmm. I actually written two novels. Feral and um, Crisis Artifact. But Rich Dowglish, we call him the butcher, made sure they weren't novels. <laughs> he had they, yeah. them down so tight. They fell, they all my novels uh, fall, they're usually t- uh, trilogies, duologies, and they fall below, definitely below 20, uh, 40,000 words. I usually go yeah, like so 20 to 30,000. Yep. <laughs> Which novellas are 20,000 to 40,000, so they don't tap it, they don't. S- fit within the short story realm but they do have like shorter formats to storytelling yep it's for me that's just the easiest way to write because i have so many ideas i can just pop pop, pop them out and move on so or the smart thing to do would just be to put all three as a trilogy and then you have a novel but i'm Mm -hmm. i'm not like that i'm going to split it up so that you can you're like oh it's been an hour and a half i'm done with this first book Mm -hmm. all right so I wonder yeah. if you can publish in short stories and make money. Mm-hmm. Yes, you can. Indeed. Like we we're just talking. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yes. In, in, indeed. Yeah, I know um, Anne McGee's doing that right now because uh, I just had a conversation with her because I've encouraged Anne, even though we, we published several of her books. I'm like, hey, you know, we don't have a problem. We're here to support you if you want to do short, like really short stories. And she's mm-hmm. been publishing a few on uh, Kindle, but she's like – yeah, I need to get back with you and just bring them all over, and I want to finish this now. I'm like, yeah, sure thing. But um, it's a great way, especially if you're publishing a couple novels and you're like, oh, I'm not seeing any traction, but I don't want to spend six months writing another book. Mm-hmm. You have the platforms now, you know, not mm-hmm. just Kindle with any online outlet to to do this, and you know, you could grow your fan base that way. And you're like, wow, I, I spit out a short story in a day and put it, and I just gained five thousand fans, and now they're buying my book off of Amazon. Right, because that was, I think, a cool idea would be to release your chapters and then release the novel in full so that way you can get the ending. Yep. Yeah. And again, that's what we did in 2008. But again, the time wasn't right. I've done that so many times. I've been like ahead of my curve in certain situations. Like, man, if I would just like, or done something like, well, this is a great idea, but didn't push forward with it. And it's like, then it takes off. I'm like, of course it did. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Our brains are too far in the future. <laughs> so uh, one of my favorite uh, short story compilations when we're talking about like putting a bunch of short stories together growing up as a kid was uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Did I you ever read that? I remember the name, but no, I never read it. It was like a black and white cover with just red light, like had red lettering on the story part, I think. But, and I think we have it downstairs. I forgot to bring that one up. I was like trying to look for some of the books that I had mentioned here. Um, but it was like a page or two, but you, they made it into movies. So scary stories to tell in the dark. You probably should watch that 
or read that because they're great. Like, um, I'm surprised you've never read those. To no, be and it is a book. It is a movie, right? Or a TV yeah, show? Yeah, I think <clears throat> maybe one or two movies. But yeah, there's two books: Sherry, scary stories to tell in the dark, and then more scary stories to tell in the dark. But they're all short stories, and some of them even have like. I remember one page on the left was like a, a music thing. So I learned how to play it on the piano and I would like, you know, do, do, do. And it was like talking about like the, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms say a pickle uh, pick on your snout. It's like, I am. It's all about death. Then. Anyways, you can make high earnings with short stories like we've talked about. And so I looked up some of the ones that might be familiar. Uh, like the gift of the Magi. Oh, it's not Maggie. Oak. I thought it was the gift of the. And I'm messing with you. I know you. I know you knew what this was. <laughs> gift of the Magi by O. Henry. Uh, so this is a classic story that has been adapted numerous times, appearing in uh, anthologies, films, and even musicals. And during that, uh, you know, constant popularity. Um, I'm trying to think. I looked this up, but I'm trying to remember which. Uh, it'll come to me. There was a movie or something that I think like kind of took an adaptation to this. And then the next one, everybody likes this one. Yes. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I didn't know this was a novella. Uh, I mean, but every Christmas, every holiday season, boom, mm -hmm. there it is. It's all over the t television. Mm -hmm. This is this. Yeah. It's kind of like the Mariah Carey song. It's a contender for that because it's a Christmas one and people watch it. They go hand in hand. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, a lot. So I looked up a lot on Amazon and the ones that were the highest rated and most top selling were a lot of the best selling anthologies. So like uh, the best American short stories or like the O. Henry prize stories that have generated a significant amount of um, like repetitions. A lot of these are in public domain. They've been redone. They've become more popular as they're redone in, in that sense as far as print. Merchandise. Uh, people that buy merchandise for some of these stories. Um, and then, like, making movie ad adaptations, like I said. Or even taking part of it and changing it, like we've talked about in public domain, but kind of pushing that. Makes the original popular. I'm That's surprised kind of a lot of that hasn't been done. Uh, well, remember, of course, this is off topic about pride and prejudice and zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they did, of course, you know, falling into public domain, you would think that a lot of people would take more of these short stories and just floating the idea out there uh, mm -hmm. in case any of you yeah, listening want to do that. Inspiration. And we know a publisher. So. Well, you got to think, uh, and I put this down here. I can't remember where I put this in there. But uh, we'll come back to it because I did put a point in there where it talks about some other um, short stories from the past. And we'll go over that one. But why we're talking about short stories, talk about story building. How do we story build short stories? Listen so up. This help. is the teaching part of this podcast. This is the teaching part. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, so there's some key elements in a short story. Um, you got to have a plot. plot. You gotta have a plot. Like, yeah. what, what's the story about? Yeah, what are you, what's like... going to be your beginning, your middle, your end? Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do you want your story to unfold? What are the key events mm -hmm. that are going to drive your narrative? Uh, and yeah. I like to do this, I, even though, like, I'm sporadic with writing, I do like to visualize the ending. Like, where do I want to get to? What is the big bang at the end? So, And I put something in kind of the same way, because I feel like that's what I'm doing right now with Canvas. I have... And I'm, like, have, one of the I've... few who really know what's going on. <laughs> I'm going to share, actually share the notes with you because I have every chapter organized. Um, mm. Yes, please do. They're like a, a paragraph of what's going to happen in this chapter, how it's kind of, like, just, it's almost like I'm telling when I'm writing this, what is happening. And I'm going to see if you catch on to some of the stuff that I've done. Parissa so will, um, she'll text me. I know you're busy. Can you talk? And you know, by now. You can text mm -hmm. me anytime, but it's because I teach a lot. But then yeah. you remind me of me when I started with Daniel and I'm like, Ooh, I got this idea and here's what happens. And I'm over here smiling as I'm reading your notes or the text that you're sending me or when you call me and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is passion. This is the excitement. Yeah. This is what you want out of an author. And when you're an author, this is a side note. When you're an author, you need to find someone <laughs> that you can talk to and bounce ideas off of because keeping that to yourself, sometimes you're like, maybe this is good, but then maybe it's not. And so you need, I was talking, and I, I mean, I was talking to my nail tech, um, who 
she's a reader and she's so excited because I'm like, listen, we switched these gears. I given her the gist of the story. And I said, now I'm struggling with this one. And it's the same question I asked you. So I'm getting perspective yep. from you. But I'm also getting perspective from a female who reads a lot. And like, I did this in the original one here with this chapter, then to this chapter. Now that I'm switching to the supernatural paranormal, what about this, this, and this? She says, yes, keep that. She's yeah. like, that's awesome. I'm like, oh. Yeah, what you came up with after we discussed was definitely the best route. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I've additionally added to that, so <laughs> you'll be amazed. No, All right, <laughs> not you. <laughs> well, so when I'm doing this, so when I'm doing this, and this is how my brain works, um, I visualize a maze, kind of like a labyrinth of you could go this direction because there are things leading you that way. There are things like, oh, it's kind of like when you're watching the movie Labyrinth, there are doors that are invite. like this door makes me think I should be going that way. When you realize you took a wrong turn, when you're like my brain went the other way with the reading and like, oh, that's not what I expected. I should have paid attention to this one little clue. That's how I write. I write like it's a maze. So there's several ways to get to it, except for when you get there, you are probably going to hit a dead end. No, that's you... cool because there was these books. I, I'll forget the names of them. Choose your own adventure in the 80s. Like the, yes, we talked about this before. Yes, yes. like the Wizard yeah. of Firetop Mountain or something. I can't remember the names of the books. I love those books. Yeah, you've said that, I think, early in the podcast. Uh, Probably 14 times like, by now. Yes, I love this. No, you, you haven't. That's one thing you have not repeated. <laughs> wow. I'm getting better. So let's talk about what else. You got your plot. You know your beginning, your middle, and characterization. Uh, yeah. Developing memorable yeah, characters. Yeah, you, you got to make them memorable because they're, it's a small piece, but make them memorable. Yeah, they got to um, stick. I mean, and I mean, for me, it's like, do they have a certain type of snarky attitude? Is there a scar on somebody's face? Or they have uh, a an, an crazy bright red hair and these freckles that are just like little stars or something? you got to have something you can connect with them and feel like you know them. So, you know, from you know, they're like in their mannerisms, the way they look. Go ahead. You're going to say something. Well, so a good example. Um, so if we go back to um, Tiny Tim, Tiny Tim is not mentioned hardly throughout the story of A Christmas Carol. He's just a, a, a small character that's kind of there. <clears throat> Once you learn who Tiny Tim is, he becomes a part of the story from the very beginning because you know why everything's happening for that one employee. Like you, he, he's the most memorable character because he's what drives the worker to put up with Scrooge's, you know. <laughs> There's another tiny Tim that's very memorable. He plays the <laughs> ukulele and he's like seven foot tall. Tip, two, three, two, three. And he sings like Is that he, all the time. Is he dead? <laughs> yes. Rest in okay. peace. Rock star. R.I.P. Although when I now so memorable, when I hear Tiny Tim now prior to watching Insidious, <laughs> I remember that as a child, but now I watch Insidious and you hear Tiny Tim, I think of the little boy. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so image, memorable. Yeah. yeah. What else is memorable? You got to have a memorable setting. You got to you got to mm -hmm. create this space. You got to feel yeah. like and you're this in is this space. When, when we were talking about uh, Louisa May Alcott, a lot of the people in her era and in her family's circle were some of the short story writers like Hawthorne and Hemingway, yeah. these people who vividly created scenery through, through nature. So they were creating what they saw a lot for the reader to put them in that, that mindset. Conflict. Yes. We must, we must create, it doesn't have to be an aggressive conflict, but there has to be some kind of, something your your character's going through something they're facing you know it's it's you got to create some kind of like oh no what's going to happen next or just like we talked about with for sale baby shoes never used yeah well speaking of Therefore, that like and this is a light conflict it's like hey we're going to have a gender reveal you know we don't know if we're having a boy or a girl so you know and you're at the party you don't know if the everything's going to come out blue or pink from the balloons so just some those sales Yes. Yep. 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 Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a crucial to to keep your audience engaged and interested in that small space to keep reading. It's almost like you have to treat every paragraph almost like a miniature chapter. Yep. Well, because you don't have you have to. There's no time. Mm -hmm. There's you not know? much time. Seventy five hundred words is not a lot. All right, and then resolution. You know, plan. Ah, 
plan out your conflict. That was um, that gender reveal balloon blowing up. It was my family. My picture fell over. Oh. Keep my fam right there. Yes, resolution. How is that conflict going to be resolved? We have to have a result. We got to know the ending. It's got to okay, be satisfying. Anything? Well thought and out strong, resolution. Yeah, yep. a strong impact on your readers. Yep, you know, because you want them coming back for more. You don't want to, if you're going to push a short story, especially if you go to a bigger novel, don't let it be boring. Mm -hmm. I mean, really go back and watch this episode and study. Take notes. I'm checking, speaking well, of notes, plot, characterization, setting, conflict, resolution. Yeah. You have yeah. to have so, all of these. Since it's hoa 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 season, I can talk about Steffi Meyer. That what she did was she had her novels, the the four main, and then she did an offshoot, which I've talked about, Brie uh, Tanner. She did this small little offshoot of a care, a very tertiary character in the story, so tertiary that she's not like you really don't know who she is. And so she, she the reason she became into the movies was because of this offshoot book. So they put her into the to the movies. Um, otherwise, you really wouldn't know. So it's kind of like that little <laughs> tiny journal from this one character that no one knows about. So it's kind of like that short story, but it was extremely impactful because a character you didn't even hear about really in the original books, it's crazy. But then now I'm not really super excited because I love Midnight Sun, which is Twilight, but from Edward's perspective that she read, it's a very good book. Lots of information, information and backstory about the care, uh, the the Collins family and all that stuff. But now they're doing an animated series. No, but with Midnight Sun, uh, she took four books to do Twilight. Does he kind of summarize all of that <laughs> timeline? No, Twilight is its own book. Okay. Then there's New Moon. There's Eclipse, and then there's Breaking Dawn. Twilight is Bella's perspective. Uh, Midnight Sun is Edward's perspective of the exact same book. Of Twilight. Midnight so Sun only covers Twilight, the first okay. book. Yeah. All right. But anyways, <laughs> I have so, mixed feelings about the anime series, so it is what it is. All right. I got to turn my notes back on. All right. Develop characters. You know, you, ha you, ha you really do have to thoroughly develop characters if you're doing short stories. So let's start with the protagonist. You want to develop a protagonist who will be the focus of your story. Consider their background, motivations, desires, and even their flaws. What drives mm -hmm. them? Why are they the protagonist in this book? What makes you hate them? What makes you love them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when you're doing that, you have to make sure that that narrative structure is maintaining. Um, because it all has to kind of like, do you have a character that's not, has a good moral integrity or not? You know, maintain that. Are they developing in that character? When you're creating that narrative structure, you're also making that kind of go parallel with your uh, character development as well. And maintaining a theme. They kind of all go together. They're like the tr the trinity of story building. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and you put on here supporting characters. And I don't even know how I do this. But um, I've gotten pretty good at slipping characters in and out. I'll even do like little side stories within the book from a supporting character that's not very prominent to the story but adds to the development and then we move on and maybe I may mention them in the next novel, but mm -hmm. you, you do need, if you had three main characters in your book and it's just them all the time, it can get boring. So, I mean, you know, even in a yeah. short story, you got to have somebody it's like, they're not that I mean, prominent. You have to be very creative to make it a one person, unless it's just the one person's point of view. You know, you have to be very creative with that one. I feel like. Yep. So, you know, uh, so create supporting characters that help or hinder the protagonist's journey and ensure that each character has a purpose and contributes to that story. I do hate that. I've seen that before where here comes the character and I read the whole book. I'm like, why the heck did they even have that guy in that one scene? It didn't add anything to it. it could even if it was an important scene like, hey, you caused a car wreck or you stole my wallet. At least there was a reason. It's like, hey, what's up, brother? And then they walk off. Oh. But that, see, that's because you write shorter books. I think sometimes you need to have some of those filler things when you're writing a novel because otherwise it just looks too linear. Yeah. You have to incorporate small conversation that may not have anything, anything to, do, to do. Yeah. It's just the natural flow of the story and how conversation would happen. I feel like if your book is longer, more of a novel, you You'd would have, have more some room. Of that. Yeah, you would have more room to put that kind of thing, but not in a short story. Yeah, that's kind of like with your character arcs when you're creating like they start out this way and you, they 
they're here and this is where they end. You have to parallel that with your narrative structure of what you're trying to build, like what kind, like what kind of, kind of t- twist do you want with this character? Do you want them to actually fall in love? Do you want them to turn uh, from bad guy to good guy? Like, what do you, what do you want your character to develop in in this short amount of time? Well, let's talk about some examples of short stories from the past. Yes, yes. A lot of the Hindu stories that when I was studying Hinduism, a lot of those stories feature um, different, the different perspectives of like Shiva, Vishnu, um, Brahman. So there are a lot of short stories with even in that. And in India, like third century BC, uh, BC and about fifth century, there is a collection of stories, the Yakata tales. And these stories are perspectives of Buddha in previous lives. So it's a tale uh, that conveys these lessons that Buddha has uh, went through, through his reincarnation uh, and kind of like contributes to the Buddhist teaching. Because a lot of these were oral traditions, but a lot of these things were kind of taken from the Vedas and a lot of the different things that kind of came from that, from those, those uh, collections. The Canterbury Tales, that's the next one I have. So this is uh, by Geoffrey Chaucer. This is 14th century AD. This collection of stories uh, told by pilgrims traveling to Canterbury contains individual tales that explore themes of love, death, mortality, and social commentary. One thing I have found when I've researched a lot of the different types of re- uh, writing from that time frame, these were all meant to teach a lesson and uh, entertain, but they were all based on what people were going through, if that makes sense. There wasn't like a lot of like, at that time, sci-fi. There was, I mean, you had Bram Stoker. I mean, you had all these other little things that like was, that. Yeah, that was a little bit later. Yeah down the road but a lot of times with people like this this is they use a social commentary they did stuff from what they were seeing i mean they could have used this too for like uh moral structure mm-hmm. if they're if they're telling stories within modern times so you know like you know help your neighbor and you know if they lose their crops help them replant mm-hmm. i i don't know i haven't read any of the cancer fairy tales but that's what i would assume all right this next one decameron i don't even know how to say it <laughs> Decameron by Giovanni Basasio. I don't know. I probably messed that up too. 14th century yeah. AD, but it's like yeah, in the Melody. Yeah, it's similar to the Canterbury Tales. Okay. So it's another collection of short stories, and it's just told word of mouth, I'm assuming. Uh, People Fleeing the Black Death uh, features diverse themes and narratives that explore human nature. Yeah, these are probably pretty dark then. I mean, that was um, that was a rough time. Well, I mean, if you think about like Anne Frank's diary, it's a collection now, but at the same time, those were installments she was putting in what she was going through during Nazi Germany. So those were installments of her perspective from the attic she was hiding in. And you also got some early examples highlighting the evolution of short story concepts. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about narrative structure. There were early works often lacked a clear plot structure and focused on moral lessons or entertainment. So I guess that goes back to what I was saying, you know, mm-hmm. that it probably didn't really have a, a protagonist per se, or beginning, middle and ending. It's so like, mm-hmm. Oh, I see why we resolve this, but these were tales to, you know, to have uh, moral lessons. So it kept you on the right path. You know, you don't mm-hmm. break in and steal from your neighbor or, or whatnot. Yeah. So something else that um, is an evolution is that like character development that we've been talking about. So that is something that has become a little bit more complex rather than very simple as it was before. Uh, so we we have, I guess, learned to identify with different personalities. So as a species, we've also developed ways to express those types of characters in our books. Go ahead. I would say the themes earlier on were more love, loss, betrayal, search for meaning. You know, like you said earlier, it wasn't that they were telling sci-fi tales in mm-hmm. the very beginning when we were creating short stories all those hundreds of years ago. Well, think about Edgar Allan Poe. He was a <laughs> short story writer. I didn't put him on here, but he was a short story short story writer. I need to show you that properly. Short story. Anyways, but he like with even like with the the Raven. Nevermore, tapping ahead his door. All these things, you're feeling this emotion. You're feeling these, these loss this, this, that he's having of his love. So short stories, but they weren't like, there wasn't a major character development technically. There wasn't like that. It was more of the, 
the character was developed based on the actions of a raven. Absolutely. Right? And how the character himself reacted to that. I think I put that note. I, Because sometimes what I'll do when I'm writing these, I will write them in grammarly, just like blah, 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 put my stuff out there. And then I'll say, okay, make this sound a little bit better because I'll just put the stuff in there so it doesn't sound like garbage. And it'll kind of revamp it for me. And then I'll copy paste it into our notes when I'm doing certain things. Because I can be on my phone and do Grammarly really easily and have it help me uh, word things. And then I just copy paste it into our notes. So sometimes I copy paste and it's really tiny. I put something, I put some stuff in the wrong place. Because here's a few more of the, uh, the um, stories from the past I kind of threw in here as well. The Snows of Kilimanjaro by Ernest Hemingway, like we've mentioned. Yeah, that was against the backdrop of Africa's landscapes, I believe. It's been a mm -hmm. while. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and, yep. And it's the theme of regret and of Ebony death against, against these landscapes that are so beautiful. So it's kind of like you see that parallel of these beautiful, majestic landscapes that he's describing, but there's this sadness of death. So he would be a good one if you're if you want to write short stories and you want to write them eloquently, go to Amazon. You can find all his short stories on Amazon. Yeah, there is a collection. Yeah, yeah don't a just collection. be a writer, be a reader. Be a lover of reading short stories before you even begin this journey. Yeah. This next one that I found is a lot like the purge. I think I yeah, it, I kind of remember this. It's called the lottery. So I'm not sure if anybody has ever read this or The Lottery is a short story by Shirley Jackson. Uh, this was first published in 1948. And it's interesting because it's a it's a chilling ritual. This this community, they basically have this lottery and you're you're, you know, someone selected. And it's almost like a cross like the, the hundred, Hunger Games, too. There's a Hunger Games theme there. There's a Purge theme there. You don't want to so win this lottery. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> So it's, it's become one of the most famous stories in American literature that takes place in a small, seemingly normal town uh, where the residents annually have this lottery. And the story begins with the townspeople preparing for this event in a, like, this relaxed, joking manner, suggesting, you know, the festivities occasion, um, which is, and now that I'm knowing this story, I'm like, this is so creepy. <laughs> but yeah, as the lottery unfolds, mm. um, it becomes very clear that the winner is actually the ritual sac sacrifice. Um, it's very dark, has an extremely dark side. They basically, I mean, imagine when this is first out there, probably blinded the readers. Um, but it raises questions about conformity, violence, and human capacity for cruelty. Because I feel like a lot of people, especially after this week, would probably sacrifice a lot of certain types of people oh yeah it's been crazy on facebook but um, and i'm just gonna, i'm gonna say this and i don't care if somebody comes at me for this i was very displeased because we're recording this the day after 9 11 yep uh, september 11th and i got on facebook to put my my normal morning you know never forget and as i'm doing this i start realizing there is one person one person in my entire scrolling of the entire day that I saw besides myself put never forget. Everything was about the presidential debate yeah. person. I was like, this is sad. And then a friend this morning put on there. It's sad that we even, we even planned a debate to be on the eve of nine. No kidding. Because, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I can remember. Overshadowed. And I remember nine 11 because I was working construction then. And, um, uh, our operator, a crane operator, uh, Dean Kuhn, a really close friend of mine, a pastor as well. And he looks down because I always had the radio on and he's like, they just bombed the Twin Towers. I'm like, what? You're not making any sense. Oh, yeah, because at first people thought it was a bomb. Did they, or no, Yes, I mean, they thought it was a there. bomb. So like you they hit the... There. Yes. Yeah. And then, of course, it kept unfolding and people were just... In shock, but I mean, look, this happens in other countries uh, as well, and we never thought it would happen here. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now it shows you, no, no, it could happen anywhere. So, yeah. but yes, so the whole twenty-three years. Whole, yeah, the whole never forget. <clears throat> yesterday was the first day I think people forgot. Yeah. So, which is sad. I didn't forget. I just didn't post. I try to keep everything mild. And not post, not that that's mild, but you know, I try mm -hmm. not to post religion or politics, but yeah, yeah it's sad. I'm, not, I'm not trying to, I'm not choosing um, a side. What I'm saying as Americans, they definitely forgot. Um, 
The lottery that we're talking about here has been adapted in various film and television versions. Uh, one of the notable adap adaptations was a production in 1969 uh, by Larry Yust. This, um, oh my gosh, this adaptation was often used for an educational tool as well, but it made for, it also was made for TV in 1996 uh, with uh, a TV movie for with uh, Dan Cortez, Carrie Russell, and others. Like, I know I've seen this as like a movie or a TV show, so, but I don't remember one with Dan Cortez and Carrie Russell, but now I'll have to go back and find it. Yes, it is called The Lottery. They try to capture that unsettling, and I feel like we think about that, like, oh, that would never happen, but sometimes you're like, oh, I could see that definitely happening. I could see people being like, well, we need, we need to do this once once a year, and we need to purge. I mean, people well, obviously think about it. Well, it's like you said, when this book first came out, it had to shock a lot of people. That because mm -hmm. you, they didn't see it coming. And I'm sure people were so appalled by it at first. like, <clears throat> And they told their friend. And then someone was like, oh, I would never read that book. And then they secretly went out and bought it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There was another one that I wanted to share that was actually. Oh, I'm surprised. I must have. Oh, I did put this on there. But we didn't talk about this one. The, th the Thousand and One Nights. I'm sure you remember that one. That one's yeah, the Arabian it wasn't it kind of like um, like Sinbad, Arabian Nights, that type of thing? I can't remember. Uh, maybe, but I'm thinking it's well, maybe they did. That was an adaptation or whatever. But there's the Alibaba and the Forty Thieves. Oh yeah, well okay, that's falling yeah. in line. What I'm thinking. Yeah, well, it's, but see, the, the Thousand and One Nights. It's it's a collection of stories. So oh uh, yeah, many. So yeah, so there's there's individual tales within the framework of these these stories of that particular one. Excuse Alibaba, me. yes, I, I yes. love I, a lot of TV shows like that. Sinbad, Alibaba, uh, the Flying Carpet, all that stuff. Yep, mm -hmm. good times as a kid. Yes. Um, do you remember uh, the Call of the Wild? I do. I've read it as a child, and I they made a it. movie about it, right? Yeah, because they yeah, had it was the, that, yeah, yeah. the one creature. Yeah. I I can't even remember what it looked like, but I remember the one. Yeah, it was... yeah. Go ahead. Yes. It's kind of like a dog, right? Yeah, it was just like a the picture was a strange looking dog. Yeah. Too long, I can't remember. Yeah, so that one I was I remember I was looking up that one was um it was an adaptation uh, like from a st like a serialized format where um each chapter of that one was like the dog's journey showcasing like these uh transformation from uh from a domesticated pet to the wild. Wait, um, then maybe I'm thinking of the wrong one. Is this the one where he uh, the dog traveled across country? I think so. Then maybe, it's yeah. I, I remember this from a very long time ago. Like, this one was one of those ones I was like, I remember this from a long time ago. Yeah, now and, i got to look it up as you're talking. Because I, I, if, if that's the case, I remember my stepdad, when I was like 10, had me reading. I fell in love with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and, and when I was uh, researching this, some of the things that they'll, you can kind of put into short stories... Um, and, and the key here also for people who are listening that are authors to know how your book fits within the short story um, um, parameters is also when you put it into KDP or you're loading it and you're using hashtags, you can hashtag yours as a short story and not be wrong. You know I mean, how can I categorize? Well, it's technically could be considered a short story. Like gra some of the graphic novels, like uh, The Sandman, a lot of those are just... Uh, installments of this this episodic stru structure where each volume focuses on a different aspect of the sandman's myth so that's a that's a good one with um it's kind of like okay, that's where i kind of got the idea with like fan fiction each installment is like a new perspective with a new aha moment like uh, or like a, a like a what's the word am I, what word am i looking for yeah but i don't think that's what i was looking for like uh, um, squirrel just went by. So, Call of the Wild, where the wild things are, and then there was another thing. So I'm getting all these books confused. You get all but these I, wild and things. Yeah, with, with the Call of the Wild, I do remember because the dog got stolen and he ended up in Canada, and then he was fighting with other dogs. And he became more of a wild dog. He adapted. So, but mm -hmm. yes, God, it's been thirty something years. 
Yes. And Sandman. Now we're back to Sandman. Sandman. I'm the second season of that. Yeah. Okay. It's so funny. You mentioned I was going to ask you if you'd watched it. Uh, yeah. Yes. Because he's best friends with Robert Pattinson. Is he really? Yeah. And uh. he doesn't. The guy that plays that uh, character, he doesn't use social media and things like that. So he doesn't he doesn't get on all that stuff, apparently. Anyways. Alrighty. Well, this has been informative. We understand now what short stories are, where they've been, where they're going, and how they're evolving. And now so, you're ready to write your own. Yes. So get out there and write your own. If you need more help with writing your own, and you want to watch more episodes, you can follow us, and you can see us on YouTube, Spotify, uh, Amazon Music and Apple Podcasts, and you can find all of those icons if you go to the alwayswritepodcast.com. It's not the alwayswritepodcast.com. <laughs> or you can email us if you have questions, or if you have something you'd like to share, or you have a short story you'd like for us to kind of put out there for you, you can email us at alwayswritepodcast at gmail.com, and we'd be happy to share it and find ways that if you'd like to come on the podcast and uh, give us your thoughts on writing with short stories, that would be great. So, and if you need hair care product, uh, leave Chris alone. I want to ask her for me. Uh, but if you do want <laughs> tattoos, she is the bomb. <clears throat> so that was random. I know, but that's me. That's a JDHD. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening. Thank you for following. And thank you for tuning in. And I'm author Carissa Delay. And I'm author Jamie Vendera. And we'll see you in the next episode of the Always Right podcast. Yes. Thanks for listening.